People don't do that anymore. I think it's just mind blowing. They link it with Metallica. Then you realize it's rubbish. New, new, new. Play on one finger on one string. Once again, I'm very thankful that you never went through with that. I mean, yeah, the fans would like to hear them, but I don't want to. Hello, you metal pilgrims, and welcome to the new interview episode on the channel with a true heavy metal legend. The guitarist and the founder of one of the most influential bands in heavy metal, Diamond Heads, Brian Tatler. Brian, how are you, man? I'm all right, thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. Oh, it's great. Uh, are you kidding me? It's an honor and pleasure for me. Thank you. Thank you for finding time. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> great. Uh, so, Brian, uh, Right away, let's jump in right away. So obviously the big news by Diamond Head, uh, you know, is the upcoming release of the remastered version of your legendary debut record, Light Into the Nations. Why did you decide to release it now? And what new can a Diamond Head fan and overall a heavy metal fan expect from this version compared to the ones which were released before? Yes, I, it seems like it comes out about every 10 years. Um, Usually, I have a couple. <laughs> yeah, so do I. The labels usually do a 10 year licensing deal, and that deal was up in 2021. So mm -hmm. I asked Silver Lining if they would like to do the album, um, you know, in 2022, maybe do a ten, another 10 year deal. And so they were happy to do that. But I, they also asked straight away if you got any bonus material. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the thing was, I did have some bonus material because I got these tapes um, that, you know, you may have read something about. But if I tell you roughly uh, what happened, um, there was a guy involved with Diamond Head called Pete Winkleman. And uh, he has a studio in Milton Keynes called Great Linford Manor. And he said, he called me one day to say, we've had a flood in the cellar. And he said, the tapes are OK, but you should come and get them because... We could have another flood and I don't want to be responsible for them being damaged. Uh, so, this, so this might have been about eight years ago. And so I drove down there and he got a load of two inch tapes, the multi-track tapes. So about 30 of them. So I put all them in the car and amongst them were, were a couple of uh, 12 inch Ampex mm -hmm. quarter inch spools that um had Diamond Head written on them and these tracks written out in Viro and Light into the Nation, Suck in My Love, etc. And I thought, oh, I don't know, I've never seen these before. I don't know what these are. Because I've still got the album versions, you know, the the quarter inch masters for the album. So I didn't know what these were. Uh, and I brought them all back home and I've been keeping them safe. And then during lockdown, I decided I'm going to find out what's on these tapes. So I don't have a machine to play them on. I mean, you'd need a big, you know, pretty much professional tape record to play them on. And um, people don't use tapes so much, do they now? It's all it's all digital, isn't it? Pro Tools, Logic, etc. So I had to find somebody who could transfer them digitally so that I could then listen to what's on them and decide, is it a load of rubbish? Is it great? You know, uh, so I did that and it turned out it was these versions uh, from the Lightning to the Nations album, like mono mixes, but a couple of them had different vocals. There's one with a different guitar solo. There's one where the, the backing vocals are, are mixed louder and there's some bits missing. And, and I thought, I don't even remember doing these tapes. You know, maybe the engineer ran them off for the manager or for Pete Winkleman or something. Uh, and at the time, I didn't take that much notice about what was going on in the control room. You know, I'd be I'd be out in the studio doing my bit, playing the guitar. Uh, so it, to listen to them for the first time in like 40 odd years was really strange. And uh, but I thought these are the sort of things that a, that a fan would like to hear because nobody's ever heard them. They've never been on anything. Uh, so that that's how this happened um and um it, it just makes the package a little bit different to any previous version and uh you know it's got new cover new new notes and uh, it remastered it's been remastered from the umatic tape this time because the uh, quarter inch was mastered in 1993 mm -hmm. at a mastering suite in london and i kept the, the umatic version mm -hmm. uh 
And we we listened to both versions, and we thought the umatic version was better than the actual quarter inch uh, stereo master from 1980. And so we remastered it from that. It was clearer and brighter, so there was no comparison. So this is a you know as good as it can possibly be, really. That is true, and I, I have to agree with you. I had a pleasure of listening to it already, and uh, you know Thank I you. enjoyed it, and I. I, I've kept it on repeat for several times and I couldn't just, you know, couldn't stop thinking in my head that if I would have heard that 20 something years <laughs> ago, oh my God, I'd be even more blown away than I was. <laughs> no, because this, this sound just opens up the songs in a completely new and, you know, way. You know? Yeah, yeah. It was really frustrating at the time because we made this record. And we all were very proud of it. We'd been working on these songs. You know, Diamond Head was formed in 76. So we worked for four years at writing and, and doing, we probably did about 25 gigs by the time we went into the studio to record. Mm -hmm. uh, but we couldn't get a deal with it. And uh, so that was really frustrating to think, well, we we like these songs. Uh, there is, these are our seven best songs, really. Uh, how, how can we not get a deal with it? And <laughs> what the hell have we got to do to get a deal? You know, so that was a frustrating time in 1980, 81. I can imagine, I can imagine. And you stated before, since you started speaking about this, that you've had over 100 songs, if, this yeah. is, if I remember correctly, right? Ready before the debut record. I, I think it's just mind blowing. I don't think that any yeah. other band in, in the history had, you know, had that much before. <laughs> No, people, people don't do that anymore. I've no, spoke no. to young bands and I'll say, how many songs have you got? And they might go, nine, maybe 10. And mm -hmm. I think you've got more than that. You've got to have some choice. We, we wrote from the minute we started, we started writing and we didn't have a studio or anything. So we would just do little cassettes in the bedroom, guitar, drums, vocal, sometimes even without bass. And, um, we, we, we'd write the song, we'd record it on cassette, make a note of the nat, the title. Uh, but, but you know, in hindsight, Sean was very, very good at coming up with lyrics on the spot. He'd just mm -hmm. make stuff up. He'd make up a tune. So I could come up with a riff. Do, 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 do. And, and within 30 seconds, Sean would jump in with a vocal idea. And that don't happen very often. Because yeah. I've worked with other people and I've realised, oh, Okay, so that that's unusual. That is very often you don't hear the vocal until you're actually in the studio and it's time for the singer to put the vocals on. Yeah, and then uh, it's rubbish. And <laughs> yeah, but Sean would be throwing out ideas all the time, and and we so we we we'd written a hundred songs, I reckon, by the time we went into the studio in 1980. That's over four years, but that's still pretty good going. Um, to have a hundred songs. And of course the seven songs are the, were the best songs at the time because we just put our best ones on. We've got some other good ones. We've got To Heaven From Hell. We've got Dead Reckoning. We've got, um, what else have we got? We've got a couple of others that went on. Oh, Wild On The Streets. That went on an album later on uh, down the line. But uh, the, we thought those seven ones were the best at the time. and. Uh, so that there you go. <laughs> Lightning to the Nations, in fact, features, you, you spoke about how you would come up with riffs on spot, uh, which is which is just mind blowing because it does feature some of the, you know, most revolutionary guitar riffs, back, okay. right, by, by you. So how do you think that had even become possible? Who were your guitar heroes and did you try to imitate them or did you try to do the opposite? And that's how basically it, it emerged. I don't think I tried to do the opposite. I think I, I think we all did. We all had our heroes within the band. We all liked certain players uh, and certain albums and certain sounds. Um, and my heroes were Richie Blackmore, mm -hmm. um, Jimmy Page, Michael Schenker, uh, Van Halen slightly later. Yeah, but but um, yeah, I probably just wanted to. And Tony Iommi, you know, for a riff writer. What an incredible riff writer. So I was I was trying to compete with some of the greatest guitarists of all time, not just as players, but as writers. And I think the writing to me is more important than, you know, the playing. 
I, I was never just focused on solos. It w- it seemed to be I wanted to write, you know, Black Dog or or um, uh, what would what could you say, um, uh, Highway Star or something. I wanted to write a classic song, Symptom of the Universe, uh, that would live forever. You know, I didn't just think my my bit comes in at two minutes 30 and I, I show off for a bit you know that was never my intention Sean and I worked very well together um and we we just kept coming up with with good good ideas the, I mean, obviously the first songs weren't very good we we did what we used to call little dirges you know we'd have play on one finger on one string and stuff but there were songs you know we had, we had a song called black ship sailing i remember and uh, there was one called going east and they weren't very good but we'd take them on cassette listen to them analyze them and go no <laughs> you know <laughs> let's let's try again let's write i've got this riff let's and off we go but yeah we wrote a lot of songs together and uh, we, we worked you know really well we bounced off each other sean was brilliant in certain areas and i i was good in certain areas and i think we just made a, a good a good, really good songwriting team you did you did definitely did and but do you have any of those old tapes yeah. uh, from before the light into the nation do you have I've, got a, to I've got most of them and they're all on cassette i mean i don't really play them very often but uh, from 76 i've got cassettes that going back that far wow um, do you ever think about releasing those as no. actual songs? No, <laughs> I don't want to. They're 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 private. They're they're pretty rough and ready, you know, bedroom <laughs> or rehearsal room. Um, and, and the intention was to just get the idea down onto tape, and so no, no, I don't want to. I don't want people, and I don't think Sean, Colin, and Duncan would like it either if I. You know, I've got the tapes. I I was the guy with the cassette player recorder, but I, I'm not going to put them out. This, I mean, yeah, the fans would like to hear them, but I don't want to. And back then, you had, you know, and still have some amazing bands coming out of the West Midlands in the United Kingdom, right around Birmingham area. And um, did you feel like back, you know, back in the late 1970s? Uh, a band from your area could you know be anything and and, and become yeah. you know the biggest ones in the world you had judas priest you had yeah. black sabbath and you know when exactly yeah. well the fact that they were from birmingham and midlands uh inspired us uh massively we just thought we if they can do it we can do it we and, and robert plant and john bonham both midlanders oh. so it just seemed like they weren't go- gods from Mount Olympus, you know, there were real guys who lived in this area. And you'd sometimes see Robert Plant, you know, in, in, in Wollaston or Stourbridge. And uh, you think, wow, you know, so it's just a case of write songs, do gigs, try and get a record deal. You know, it seemed a long way to the top, uh, to use Bon Scott's line, but it, it didn't seem impossible. Uh, so we, you know, we, we're very ambitious. We we had that naive uh, confidence that we could go all the way. So we just went for it 100%. Your career since then, of course, had its ups and downs, you know, like of very much. But yet I have this feeling that right now in the 21st century, Diamond Head actually, in fact, has a much more consistent diehard following than you guys did, you know, ever in your career. Maybe even more so than, you know, in the, in the mid to late 1980s. Um, and I might be wrong, but this is just the feeling I got personally, but why do you think it's so? Um, I mean, the fact that we've been around a long time helps, but we, we had a good following in England and, and well, the UK, Scotland, you know, and Wales, because we'd play a lot of gigs in the, in the early 80s. But we never went abroad hardly. We, we toured Europe in 83. Uh, we never went to the States. Uh, and so, and there's lots of countries that we've still never visited. So, Ukraine, for example, you have to come after we have a little problem right now going on in Ukraine. Yes, <laughs> you know, you know, um, we win this war, you have to come. <laughs> yeah, once once it's all over, maybe. Yeah. I've never been to Ukraine. I, I mean, it's a shame. The only time I see it on TV now is is the conflict, um, and I do sympathise, and I, I do think. Uh, it, uh, it's ridiculous of, of 
Putin to uh, invade Ukraine. What what's he thinking? Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. He's a crazy man. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. I support Ukraine totally. But yeah, that would be, that would be nice. There's, there's lots of places we've never been. Uh, we've never been to Australia and New Zealand, and we're about to go to South America uh, in a couple of weeks' time for the first time in in a, in a long career. So it, yeah. it just seems to be difficult to get out there. The, I mean, damn it, it stopped twice, which didn't help. You know, once a band stops, it's hard to get the momentum back again. Of course. Uh, but we've been going flat out since 2000 now, and we're doing everything we can to, to capitalize. And your latest release was just a masterpiece once again. I personally, you know, mm-hmm. when it came out, I had it on repeat for, I don't know, for a month, I think. <laughs> I didn't stop listening to it. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And your new vocalist is, is amazing, of course. Yeah, he's awesome. Rasmus, yeah. He is. Rasmus is amazing, yeah. Yes, he is. He's yeah. a good find, a lucky find. <laughs> That's true. Man, I, I, as I told you, I can go on forever. So a couple more questions and then I'll let you go. <laughs> Brian, you, as, as I mentioned already, as one of the most influential guitarists uh, in the world of heavy metal, you did a huge favor to all of the metal heads around the world. First of all, by producing your own music, which is still loved 40 years later. And secondly, for basically kickstarting the big four of thrash metal, because in Metallica, Megadeth, and everyone have cited you as, you know, as their influence throughout the years, and they still are. And do you ever think that if, you know, if it wouldn't have been for, for the big four, uh, who were basically, you know, grew on the seeds you planted, uh, you would have ended Diamond Head back, you know, when you first split? Um, I think, yes, I think if Metallica hadn't covered Diamond Head, they, the first cover was 84 when they did Am I Evil on the B side of, of um, Creeping Death. Yeah. Um, so I think if they hadn't, I may have, have uh, looked elsewhere for, you know, employment. Uh, I think it would have been harder to keep Diamond Head going without that, you know, um, sort of introduction to their fan base. Uh, and bringing people on side because that record sold millions of copies. You know, versions of Am I Evil is, uh, has sold millions of copies through Metallica. And so, so many more people know of Diamond there, thanks to Lars and Co. Uh, and it may be that a lot of the opportunities that we get now would not be there without that Metallica connection. Um, so I'm eternally grateful. Obviously, I, you know, myself and Sean still get writer's royalties but even so you know it's i just think it's helped diamond head as a name and a brand and uh, uh to to get on more and more opportunities get festivals and and supports because they they link it with metallica you know they think oh, okay well you you potentially took tapping into a huge market once again i'm very thankful that you never he never went through uh, with that and uh, kept on going because your latest material is once again amazing. And I yeah. hope to hear more and more of the new songs from you, which brings us to the final question. What will be after? And I know that you haven't released the Lightning to the Nations, but do you already have plans for the new material uh, from yes. Lightning? Oh, yes. I start, started in 2020 because mm-hmm. uh, Coffin Train came out in 2019. Um, so you may as well, you know, if, once it's all done and dusted, you may as well just start writing again for the next record. Uh, so because of lockdown, I, I spent a lot of time at home. I've got a home studio uh, and there's no more gigs. All our gigs fell away like every other band. And uh, I just thought well, the most constructive thing I can do is write songs now for, for the next record. So that's been going on. We've managed to do demos We've got in rehearsal room probably for a couple of, couple of probably a, about a week or so, you know, mm-hmm. split over a couple of days. And uh, we've, we've gone through the stuff, we've recorded them. And so we've got enough stuff. We've got probably more than we need. So mm-hmm. we, can, we can afford to be a bit picky. And then hopefully we can start recording the drums in next year. January seems like a good month to record drums <laughs> so it may, it may happen early next year any message you want to give to your fans both in ukraine and worldwide 
uh, old and new? Anything you want to share with them? Um, well, if, you, if you're if you already a Diamond Head fan, thank you for helping and supporting the band uh, over the years. Uh, keep the faith. Um, and if, you, if you're not, check us out. You know, a lot of people got into the band through Metallica. I've, I've heard that message a lot of times, I'll say. I didn't know about Diamond Head, but I, I saw the name, you know, originally recorded by Diamond Head on this Am I Evil, for example. And, uh, and then they find this whole new band, a whole new, you know, wealth of material that they hadn't uh, even listened to. So, yeah, I mean, check it out. Have a look. Have a look and buy the record, buy a T-shirt. Just we, we're doing our best to, to get out and, and, and about. It's uh, as normal uh, finance. Finances are the problem um, when you when you've got to uh, you know buy that higher equipment and vans and flights and you name it. it it's it's an expensive uh, setup to tour. Mm -hmm. But uh, hopefully I'll be able to catch you back on the road sometime very very soon. Yeah. Hopefully next year and uh, yeah. in Ukraine or elsewhere. I'd love to. Uh, you know, see you live and head back to Am I Evil and all the other amazing songs you guys uh, yeah. uh, have written throughout the years. We've got a big tour with Saxon coming up. Yes. Uh, in, yeah. uh, we do Europe in October and then the UK in November. So there's about 30 plus dates there. Uh, so Ukraine's not on that list, I'm afraid. <laughs> we are not on anyone's <laughs> list at the moment. <laughs> but, um, we are doing Europe. Yeah, so make <laughs> sure to catch two new Wave of British Heavy Metal Legends touring together. This is a great opportunity to uh, oh, I agree. Uh, into the world of new Wave of British Heavy Metal. Brian Tetler, everyone, thank you so much, Brian, for joining me today. Thank you, and uh, have, a, have a great day. Keep rocking, man. Thank you. You too. Thanks for the interview.